Hello, Outlaw Nation. Happy New Year. Hope you're doing well. This is the first Outlaw Nation show of 2022. You know, the last time I saw you all, it was Christmas. I was doing giveaways and uh, handouts uh, in terms of digital codes for movies. We were catching up with each other. I was giving you my plans for my holidays, heading home to Virginia. That was a really nice time seeing my mom, seeing my sister, seeing my family. Being there back in Virginia, so close to D.C., and you know, it just felt different being back home, and I'm going to talk about it in just a little bit, and for those of you who are tuning in to this episode and this show tonight, thank you so much. This is going to be kind of a different show, a special episode we're doing of the Outlaw Nation shows. We're commemorating the one-year anniversary of the uh, insurrection, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. You know, I used to have a show on here called Impolite Truths. Well, we kind of dived into the politics of everything week after week after week. And then when we hit a little bit of a lull, we just felt like it was time to kind of put the show to bed. And we haven't gone back to it, me and Dorin Adeliano. But it doesn't mean that I'm not still reading up all this stuff and watching, uh, you know, uh, videos on all of it and ke keeping track of all the stuff that's going on. So we're going to be breaking it down and talking about um, what we feel now a year later on January 6th. You know, we saw President Biden earlier today delivering some very forceful words in his speech about going after the people who are threatening our democracy kept calling um uh president trump former president trump for the former president never said his name once during the speech and then yesterday i watched the merrick garland speech which was about 20 25 minutes there you can watch it anywhere on youtube talking about how they're going to go after the conspirators the facilitators the financiers of the attack that happened a year ago no matter what level they're at well you know this those are nice words to say but I think a lot of us are wondering if this is actually going to go as high as they seem to be claiming that they're willing to go. We shall see. But I hope you all are doing well. I'm going to get into all of that here. And I've got a very special guest joining me in just a second. But I just wanted to make sure you all are doing well. Check in with you. Hope you had a happy Christmas or Merry Christmas, rather. Hope you had a happy New Year. Hope you enjoyed your time. And I know it's crazy right now with Omicron in 2021 and the you know, everything's starting to shut down. You know, flights are getting canceled. People are getting frustrated. Some people are just done with it, whether they're vaxxed and boosted or not. They're just done with all the restrictions and the shutdowns and everything like that. And of course, Omicron being the most transmissible of the variants so far, but the least deadly, at least so far, uh, kind of helps people have that attitude a little bit more, no matter what side of the fence they're on in terms of vaccination status. We've seen some angry situations. I just uh, read last night in Orange County, California, that a man here from Poway, just a few minutes away from where I live, about 12 minutes away from where I live, um, attacked two workers there at the vaccination site because he got crazy ideas in his head that they're using this vaccination to kill people. And it's just completely unstable, mentally unbalanced people who are being influenced by misinformation to act the fool and to go out there and threaten political violence. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here tonight in our January 6th um, commemorative episode here where we look back on what's happened over the last year or last 12 months, where we're at now as a country, this idea that political violence, which seemed to be the last option, the nuclear option, for lack of a better term, in a discourse has now become the go-to option for a lot of people in this country who are being goaded, influenced, pushed, brainwashed, transformed into feeling like this is the only option available to them because they're frustrated that they don't get their way as immediately as they would like. Instead of going through the process of voting and politics and electing leaders, they're mad if they don't win those elections. So their other option is to just beat people up, shoot people, show up at a rally on January 6th in the Capitol, armed to the teeth and ready to kill, murder, maim, rape, hurt, and or destroy human beings uh, from a different political party. And that is the kind of madness that we are experienced or we have experienced uh, since that day. And according to uh, former President Bill Clinton and other people, other officials, it is on the rise. And there was a recent report that was issued that said that uh, this is no longer right-wing extremism. These are white-collar people. These are people that own their own businesses. Apparently, 60% of the people, I don't know how they came to that number, maybe 60% of the people they interviewed um, who were there at the uh, Stop the Steal or whatever that rally was called there January 6th a year ago were people who own their own businesses, regular people who work every day alongside you, your friends, your family, your workmates, whatever. They have, are part of this movement now to believe 
that elections are being stolen, to believe that their way of life is being threatened by another way of life. And they're long, they're no longer happy with just accepting the loss of an election and trying better next time. Now there's real ramifications for these people that have got it in their heads that there's no other option but to commit violence uh, in order to enact their points of views without, of course, with it, w- without being aware of the hypocrisy of the fact that that's essentially tyranny. So a lot to explore here tonight as we jump into um, looking back on January 6th, the year later. Thank you so much to the 52 of you who are joining me right now live. Please, for the, uh, for the love of God, give this video a like. If you're watching it later, and a lot of you do, leave a comment down below. Give me your thoughts. Be respectful. I'm all for discourse. If you believe one thing or the other, be respectful in the delivery of a discourse. If you're a dick, I'm going to delete your comment. Male or female, if you're a dick, I'm going to delete your comment. Let's just put it there. I always read the comments and the stupid comments I delete. Absolutely. So just you could waste all your time writing 10 paragraphs. I'm going to delete it as soon as I see it because I usually get the notification within seconds. So don't waste your time with that nonsense. If you want to have actual discourse, then please, we are open to it. And people who are here joining us live, if you believe the election was stolen and you want to come in live, I want to talk to you. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to give you a platform to talk about it because I want to understand people like you because it is so obvious to me that this is all lies. And even today, uh, they, the uh, a number of federal officials came out with reports that this idea that there were FBI people implanted or Antifa people implanted amongst the January 6th uh, uh, insurrection attempt, the coup attempt that happened a year ago is an utter a baseless lie with absolutely no evidence at all um, in truth. So uh, we're going to get into all of that here, and I'm very excited to bring on my guest for this evening. He's a gentleman I've gotten to know for many, many years now as a friend. We've had numerous conversations running the gamut from mainstream stuff, sports, politics, TV, entertainment, and especially film because he is the co-host of the podcast that we both do together, The Cinephiles. He's also a political junkie, a guy who listens to books faster than most people read them, uh, and a pretty incredible guy whose who's intelligence and opinion I respect. He was a frequent guest on Impolite Truths, and I'm excited for us to walk into the world of politics together. Since we've always walked into the world of film, we it's always a blast to occasionally, to occasionally get the time to walk into the world of politics together. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome film director, film historian, teacher um political junkie and my friend steve morris how are you steve i'm good thank you for that incredible introduction you (laughs) you are an it you know if i were ever to introduce you i would introduce you as one of the great introducers (laughs) so thank Thank you you thank you and thank you for having me on the show of course please thank you for taking the time to come on steve you know this is an issue that um a lot of us feel very strongly about you and I being political junkies as we are reading as much as we can, listening to as much as we can. This is an interesting day to be looking back a year later. I mean, I don't know if you can remember the feelings a year later on January 6th. What was going on for you as you were witnessing this happen? I mean, to me, this is like the Kennedy assassination, landing on the moon, 9-11 and January 6th. We see the right wing already, Fox News and all of them today are, oh, they're in their feelings there. And they're just looking to debase the fact that this happened. They're lying through their teeth um, about how this was just people visiting the Capitol or whatever. Even Carl Rove came out with an editorial in the Wall Street. Of all people, Carl Rove came out um, admonishing Republicans who are not willing to speak out about what happened on January 6th. And all of them. We're not at the uh, Congress today, except for Liz Cheney and her dad, Dick Cheney, showed up as well to support her and call out Republicans for not being there because they claim they're at a funeral or whatever, which, of course, could have never been rescheduled. Uh, So just an interesting way that they use even a person's death to manipulate their way out of getting out of any responsibility of being there as Democrats who were the ones threatened that day commemorate what happened a year ago so talk to me tell me what was your what's your feeling now a year do you remember what 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 your feeling was then and what you're feeling now about january 6th i absolutely remember i was sitting right here at this desk when this started to happen okay and i was in fact editing the cinephiles and you know how things start to sort of come in whether it's through twitter or through a text and and i went oh there's something weird going on and i can so remember the moment and it's exactly the moment I had 15 years ago when Katrina hit. 
And yeah. it's certainly, you know, 20 years ago with 9-11 where suddenly the world stopped. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, like, I could not continue to work. I could, yeah. It was no longer a normal day. And I remember as it escalated and kept escalating, right. there was such a sense of unreality of like, well, this this can't really be happening. And then right. just, and I remember I, I, I went inside and I'm sitting down in front of the TV and doing the, you know, news, you know, CNN to PBS to whatever news source switch right. around to kind of get the information. And Karen is sitting at her desk, which was nearby. And finally I was just going, no, no, you have to, you have to come over. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I think she called me first. Mm -hmm. I think she called me first to say, something's going on and i i think the first thing i said was sort of no no it's gonna be okay don't worry we're gonna and then it really wasn't okay it yeah. was it was nothing about this that was okay yeah well i mean what's fascinating too about that day, and i remember I, I i think i was doing something working on something myself came out and just turned on the television and all of a sudden seeing what was happening because we're on west coast time so that had been i mean this they breached the Capitol about 1.30 p.m. So this is about 10.30 a.m. our time. They breached the Capitol and the uh, went into through the barriers. And I remember watching that. And I just, I felt like I was watching a third world country, Steve. I felt like I was watching something from another country, not from America. And I, I, I went through this process. And I don't know if any of you watching now or if you yourself, Steve, went through this process where you're like, I cannot accept what I am seeing. My eyes are telling me that I'm watching an insurrection, a coup attempt, violent people trying to overthrow a fair and free election that where there was no election fraud. I'm watching people go in there armed to the teeth doing these things. And this is, this doesn't make sense to me. This doesn't compute. And they're doing this for some, you know, uh, overweight, uh, failed, crazy, unstable businessman who's all about his ego. There's no real leader here of any kind of note or power. So you say to yourself, how is this possible? How can you follow someone like this and allow your life to be um, put into the hands of someone like this? I found that to be insane. And then immediately jumped on here and started doing a live episode of Impolite Truths because I had to talk about it with somebody and I had to hear from yeah. people to feel connected to America again. I, I, It really, I think what the last five years have done has really sh deeply shaken a bunch of stuff that I believed both about this country and about human beings in general. Yeah. And that, you know, and like for me, everything begins with George Washington, not choosing to run for a third term is that he, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, because he steps down because yeah. he could have been president for life. Oh, There's probably nobody more, sure. nobody more popular in the world. He's the first president. And he says, it is important to show that I am not the government, that the right. government will move on. And that, and up until FDR, nobody ran for more than two terms because of George Washington. Mm -hmm. And you take that and, and regard, and there are throughout American history, all sorts of poli political people who hated each other. Yeah, there are all sure. sorts of people where they were furious that this is, you know, whether it was Richard Nixon or Andrew Johnson or, you know, like on and on and on, we could list yeah. all these hated people and huge divides. And right. yet every single time after four years, they peacefully had an exchange of power. And you go yeah. even to 2000 with Bush Gore and like, that's as close an election as ever has been in American history, where it yeah. literally is a couple of hanging chads that makes the difference. And finally, the Supreme Court decides what's going to happen. And who is the person like Mike Pence who has to proceed, you know, be, preside, over, yeah. preside over Congress is Al Gore. And yeah. Al Gore says, basically, what's it's more important that George W. Bush becomes president to show that America keeps going, that yeah. we have trust in these institutions. And on January 6th last year, that ended. Right. And 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 th and this is like, you know, I really believe democracy works on faith. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe right. that the system works, it won't. Right. And right now, and the fact that we had a president of the United States who, you know, because there was no secret about this. That's what's mm -hmm. so amazing. Yeah, yeah. Every from the beginning of his campaign, the guy told us who he was. Yep. He said in 2016 he wouldn't necessarily accept the results of the election. He said over the summer he's not going to accept the results of the election. And right. lo and behold, he didn't. Right. And at every step, he spread these lies. And these lies were spread by other people. And it has destabilized our democracy to the point where, for the first time in my life, 
Yeah. I don't know that we're going to have a democracy a couple of years from now. Well, hell, even later on this year, I mean, the, right now, according to a lot of people who monitor elections, that it looks like the House is going to go back into Republican control. The same Republicans who, you know, in, investigated Benghazi for 400 years, but have an issue with having a, a, any kind of investigation of January 6th past a week. And, you know, this kind of nonsense that these are the people that are going to be in charge and then essentially de- uh, what do you want to say? Deconstruct or destroy any investigations done by the Congress or the House to look into what happened on January 6th. Why? Because in their own way, they are complicit, whether they were a part of it or not, they are complicit and desperate to maintain political power. This is what is, is so fascinating to me. If you look across the country, there are less and less people signing up to join to join the Republican Party. There's less and less people. I think this is a party that is absolutely desperate and scared to lose power. So they've embraced the cult of Trump and they have found that this is the pathway. But the problem is, if this is what you hook your future to, you are essentially connecting your future to a monster that you're creating that you have no control over and that you are a slave to. These supposedly tough, proud Republicans who aren't going to take any crap from anybody and talk about being in your feelings. The second Trump doesn't look at them right, they're crying like babies in front of him and going and visiting him in Mar-a-Lago and kissing the ring. I find that to be fascinating, this kind of behavior in order to achieve political power. And we're seeing more of the mainstream Republicans starting to retire because they don't want to deal with the nonsense. We're seeing people on the Democratic side of things who are wanting to retire because they don't want to deal with the nonsense. I can't remember the name of the Florida congresswoman who helped Pelosi take the House. She, uh, Carol Malone, I think is her name, she recently announced that she's retiring because she wants to spend time with her children. So what they've done, Steve, as you mentioned here earlier, by destabilizing our democratic institutions, you're in essence making it unattractive, even more than ever, to become a politician and be part of it because you essentially have to walk into a, into a Congress and uh, regress to 15 years old or 14 years old in high school and act like a child and make sure you, you know, uh, th throw out the worst insults at them to get them back and hold to your crew. And you've got your burn book. These aren't adults. These are children. And it's frustrating, man. It, I think we are witnessing more feckless sycophancy yeah. to use some big words than I, than you know, we've ever seen is that, yeah. and it's so sad. And I, I want to, I, I really think, you know, there's that expression hoisted on your own petard, whatever the hell that means, <laughs> but like that is what has happened to the Republican party. And if you look back at the beginnings of Fox news, it's, it's hilarious that Carl Rove wrote that ah. because Carl Rove was the architect of yes. this yeah. is that what happened was, is that they found a coalition between the wealthy Republicans yeah. who felt they could use the far right of the religious right of the Republicans and and get a lot of anger. And they went, oh, we can use this to keep ourselves in power. Yeah. And so you see them throwing more fuel on that fire over and over again. And what happened was at a certain point, it's like they thought they were going to control the tiger and yeah. the tiger ended up controlling them. Right. And so now suddenly they're bowing down to fucking Donald Trump. Yeah. who they all hate like oh, and yeah. it's, you know it's over and over again we hear you know i mean we heard what lindsey graham said about the guy before the election we heard what ted yeah. cruz said about him we heard they all hate him and yet they they have realized that he is their only way yeah. to maintain power and not to this is not in anybody's defense but the fact is that under trump the republicans were really really successful in a bunch of ways the biggest one being the courts yeah, is that the, the Republicans got more people, not just on the Supreme Court, but on all the federal benches than I think it ever happened in history. Yeah. And that is and those are young people, a lot, 30, 40 years old, who are going to be on these courts for a long, long time. And the other is environmental regulations as they mm -hmm. trashed environmental re regulations. And so they might hate the guy, but they kind of yeah. feel that they need him. And because Trump who doesn't care about any traditions, any rules. He doesn't know about any rules. I don't think, right. I don't think he can pass a basic test on how democracy works, no. but he doesn't care about any of that stuff. And so if he doesn't like you, he'll make sure you're primaried. Yeah. And so, and, and that means that the Republican party will be split if you don't bow down and do what he says. And that's what we're seeing right now.
Yeah, and I think this is what's happening. And, and you're seeing Republicans like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinziger who are fighting back, who are trying, you know, being part of the January 6th panel or that or committee rather that is investigating all of this. They're trying that is a bipartisan committee, no matter how much their respective state GOPs want to kick them out or not recognize them as Republicans. Sorry, guys, they're Republicans. Nothing you do is going to change that. Therefore, it is still a bipartisan committee. You find that and you find let, none of them want to be a part of it. Even the people that uh, voted to overturn or to uh, impeach him, the 10 or so um, House of Representatives Republicans who voted to impeach him don't want to be part of this committee, didn't didn't fight to be part of this committee. And I'm wondering to myself, well, then where's your actual principled stand? I don't see it. You know, you see people like Joe. Do you think do you think Trump would ever let Joe Manchin go against him? You see people like Ch Manchin and Cinema. That is allowed in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, you're allowed to have free thought to to do what you, without having a president that goes, "We're going to get him kicked out. We're going to get her kicked out of her state. We're going to primary them." This is a this is a guy who's essentially a man child who wants to be feted and and get his butt kissed and essentially be a, a pseudo dictator, a faux dictator, so to speak, or actually an actual dictator, really, because anyone who disagrees with him, as you said, Steve, is immediately subject to be kicked out of their respective position. And none of them seem to have the balls or the strength or the power to go f you. I'm gonna you know follow my con. I mean, Dan Crenshaw. From one minute to the next, he is, you know, swinging left to right. You never know what side of the fence Dan is on, calling out people like the jokes like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, and then at the same time also going uh, hard, going hardcore against the Democrats on certain things. So it's just it's just fascinating to watch this whole thing happen. And and you know, Liz Cheney said, "I I want to move us back to the place where we're having an argument about issues, yeah. not about um, being enslaved to a cult of Trump." You know. Well, I mean, there have been a few people that, uh, like Liz Cheney, mm -hmm. where they have clearly made a stand, like apparently Karl Rove, um, uh, but and also George W. Bush, where they've clearly like made a statement that this isn't right. But yeah. it is a ridiculously small minority. I yeah. mean, it, you know, it, the the and the moment at which they decided not to support an investigation, yeah, is the moment at which because you know I mean you know me John you know me a long time and maybe you and I have even come into conflict because I tend to be more listen to the other side moderate like let's sure. try to yeah. let's try to work together nothing wrong with that yeah the moment that they that the Republican Party as a group said we are not going to investigate an attack on the Capitol yeah that and even even if there even if Trump had no connection to what happened at all even if his staff had nothing to do with it you yeah. would still want to investigate it yeah. like even to prove that Trump is completely innocent, which he's not. Right. But right. even if that's what you, the moment that he said, we're, we're not going to investigate. I went, fuck you guys. Yeah. Like that's not because this was a, there's, I mean, there are memos. We've seen these memos of like, this is how we're going to overturn the election. Right. And we even have these people that are allowing it. It relates a lot to COVID mm -hmm. because, and this is what I mean is that, if, if you weaken people's belief in the vaccine and then a whole bunch of people don't take the vaccine and a whole bunch of people die. Yeah. And here you weaken the belief that the election was fair and a whole bunch of people, guess what? They believe that Biden was not elected fairly. And yeah. now our democracy is in deep, deep shit. And if you're willing to support Trump to the cost of our democracy, like the yeah. future of America, then fuck you. Yeah, I mean, there you go. There's some strong comments from Steve Morris. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is the thing that you look at is you wonder, like, do you care about the country for real or do you care about power? And this is, and as you said, this has been happening for a number of decades through a few political cycles here. The Republicans, in essence, kind of pushing this narrative that, you know, they, they're coming for your guns. They're coming for you white people. They're coming. And all of this is about just the feeling that they've put into the majority population in this country that is still white that 70 to 80 percent of people in this country are the white majority they have embraced this idea that somehow their way of life is being taken from them simply because they're being asked to be a bit more respectful to people of color to uh, lgtb lgbtq people to women to uh, trans lives all of this situation they they turn into a big cry fest and you're like 
what is this all about? And that's what motivated, I think, what we saw a year ago is this narrative that's been pulsating throughout and has bled. We had been deluded that it was just, you know, the right wing extremists that were embracing this nonsense. But no, it has bled now into the mainstream, bled into the Republican mainstream to the point where 70 percent of Republicans in numerous polls believe that Joe Biden was not elected legitimately. That's millions and millions of Americans. That's not a small number by any stretch of the imagination. And that is massively unsettling. People you work with, your own family members, believe that this man is not actually their president. You know, we used to joke when um, when Trump was president through, through that, not my president, or they used to say that as well themselves with Obama. And this is this is where it really came from, right? This is where, and I've read a, I read a number of reports and uh, and uh, uh, write-ups here before we started the show and research for the show tonight. Like a lot of them pinpoint where this really hit the turbocharged speed. These uh, this idea that America is being taken from them was when Obama, Barack Obama became president. I mean, this idea that because we had a black president somehow. White people felt their way of life was being threatened. Not all white people. I just say that some white people or a large number of white people felt their lives were being threatened or their way of life was being threatened. So they allowed themselves to be more open to this nutty conspiracy shit like QAnon and, and whatever else nonsense is out there for people to believe. And you just go like, how, I mean, how threatened are you really? You know, this is what I really want to kind of, kind of strip away and go like, how threatened are you really by what is happening in our country simply because uh, disenfranchised groups, uh, historically disenfranchised groups are wanting to have a seat at the table, a bigger seat at the table, longer time at the table. Why is this such an issue? Well, uh, you, you, you brought up a lot of stuff, yeah, um, you, know me. <laughs> you know me, but uh, what I'll say is for, for what I think the Republican party and conservatives have done quite brilliantly um, and it goes back for 30 years mm -hmm. is figuring out how to create emotional connection to issues. Yeah. Not logical or rational connections necessarily. And to frame things in ways that make people very upset. Like you go burning the flag, you yeah. know, should right. we be allowed to burn the flag? And this, in terms of the, the state of America, people's standards of living, people's health, the levels yeah. of crime, this has nothing, has no meaning, has zero right. meaning whatsoever. Right. But in terms of emotions, it is a very emotional topic. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is what Republicans, whether it's focusing on Mr. Potato Head or focusing on, yeah. you know, is that they'll find an edge case and go like, and it's sort of like, well, I grew up playing with Mr. Potato Head. You shouldn't change my thing. Now, right. Mr. Potato Head doesn't matter at all. It is yeah. totally unimportant in the grand scheme of things, but it emotionally connects. And yeah. so, and, and I think, you know, you brought up Obama and there's something that just really hit me is the, uh, the whole birther thing that Obama wasn't born in this country. Right, right, right. right. I, you know, illegitimate. Yeah. Totally, totally wrong. And a total lie is that yeah. what just occurred to me when, when you brought up Obama. So I was like, oh, the, I didn't understand what that was. That right. was a test run. Yeah. And what it was, was it had nothing to do with whether or not you could prove that it was true, because, of course, it wasn't true. Right. The question was, could you get a whole bunch of people to be angry about it mm -hmm. for a long space of time? And that in, it, where, where we go like, oh, Trump was humiliated at that uh, uh, dinner at the correspondence dinner. Right. You know, and it was related to the birther thing. I think Trump is going, oh, I figured out something about Americans. Yes. Is that if I can spin a lie. And get people angry. And then, you know what it is? <laughs> we make this the strangest, the strangest analogy. Yeah. Here's my problem with the TV show Lost. Okay. Is that Lost would introduce a thing and you go, oh my God, I can't believe this thing. Right. And then in the next episode, they would introduce another thing and you go, oh my God, I can't believe this thing. And you would forget about the previous episode and they would never deal with it or resolve it. And by the time you were thinking about the next one, there's another one and another one. Yeah. That is what Trump has done. Yeah. Is that Trump every week would do something completely outrageous. And then you go, I can't believe this is so fucking outrageous. And mm -hmm. you would be in an uproar. And then he would do another outrageous thing. Right. Or spin another lie. And he kept us spinning. And we would never go back to look at the previous one. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, Bill Clinton. And there's lots of reasons to have problems with Bill Clinton. Sure. The biggest things that we spent 
years dealing yeah. with his things. You know, yeah. you mentioned Benghazi, years on yeah. Benghazi. Right. Whereas with Trump, it's only a week that we spend on a thing because there's another one. Yeah. And another one. And all of them got us emotional and it got his base emotional. And he had them out in the streets and literally willing to commit violence. I mean, the statistics now of how many people in this country believe violence might be necessary. Yeah. It's really damn scary. And I bring it back to Steve Morris years ago. What did I tell you? Yeah, the civil war is coming. I mean, everybody or a lot of people that I told thought I was ridiculous. I thought I was insane. And I'm telling you, if things don't turn around, we are going to be fighting each other in the streets. Uh, January 6th was just a dry run. A dry run that if it had succeeded, and it was minutes away from succeeding, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the new information that's coming out, if you look at those videos that have come out over the last few months, how close they were to Mike Pence, how close they actually were to breaching uh, offices, how close they were to getting, I mean, the fact that these congressmen and women could hear them right outside their offices yeah. um, as they were marching through trying to find them, you know, uh, hiding under their desks, hiding in closets, all of that, that was there. And, you know, for these Republicans who are making fun of these Democrats, for these uh, talking bobbleheads over on Fox News like Tucker Carlson and Hannity and Laura Ingram, for them to make fun of Democrats uh, and the Congress people who are talking about it, say their experiences, is a, a hypocritical lie. Because I'll tell you that right there, right, I'll tell you something right now, and this is something that Karl Rove said in the piece, um, in his piece. If this had been Democrats attacking the Capitol after Trump and his razor thin margins of victory in these states that he lost this time around by, uh, you know, by margins, uh, smaller margins. If the if the Democrats or Democrats had stormed the Capitol and breached the, those same Republican congressmen and women would be cowering under their desks and then talking all year about their feelings and how scared they were and how close they came to dying and all of that. So for them to turn around and vilify an entire political party because they're speaking about their human honest human reactions it shows you the true um how can i say this the true uh, loss of humanity within people who are in the sphere of trump it's like you almost have to be a sociopathic nutball in order to be the right person to be in this atmosphere we've been seeing peter navarro over the last few days coming out and and brazenly admitting that they had a stop the steal uh, uh was it the green bay sweep or whatever they were calling it to, uh, to take the election back, to actually use the political levers of power and to pull them to force the vice president, Mike Pence, to not certify the election. Because they had this whole thing, and Peter Navarro claims that it was the people who were out there who breached the Capitol who ruined it, and that is horseshit. They're pushing yet another narrative where they try to excuse the people who were there because those are the people who are going to vote for these people, uh, and then make it seem as if they had this really brilliant plan to, to overturn the election it's it's a joke it's a comical joke to watch this nonsense happening this was a full-on coup attempt and the fact that we're hearing now that the president was sitting the former president was sitting there for hours ignoring people who were telling him to come out and say something and watching the coverage on television that tells you this man was invested in this coup happening so uh one thing just to go back to you talk about yep. the republicans making fun of the Democrats who saying what their emotional experience to be real clear, the mm -hmm. Republicans were scared too. It was a scary moment. That's very true. You see the guy who said it was just uh, uh, visitors or tourists. He is scree He is being, yeah. he is, he's scared against the wall and security is covering him. He's an absolute liar. Yeah. I mean, it is, it was really, really close to being something really much, much worse. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it's a miracle that they, that they actually got the writers out. And I want to also offer a retraction is that I remember, and I, I came on in polite truths uh, literally yep. a year ago today yep. is that at the time we were talking about how obvious it seemed to us that the police were treating the, these insurrectionists differently yep. than they were to the George Floyd protests. Right. And certainly it looked that way. And having now heard many, many, many stories of what the Capitol police went through on that day. Yeah. I don't blame those policemen like mm. there was certainly uh, I certainly blame the fact that they weren't prepared, that they didn't, yeah. that this was very obviously coming and multiple intelligence agencies predicted that there could be violence there. Yes. And they just had some, you know, temporary barricades and a very small number of 
Capitol Police to guard it. But those individual officers were in an impossible and very, very scary and very dangerous position. So the fact that I was blaming them a year ago, I really apologize for and want to give them all the respect that they deserve. Yeah, there was only 1,400 officers there that day to handle the situation. And, you know, considering some what we're hearing now, some of those memos that have been released through the Freedom of Information Act, we're seeing that they've been ha they were having conversations about the possibility of violence um, days before this was going yeah. to happen. They had an idea. This isn't like the 9-11 memo that Condoleezza Rice ignored or whatever. This right. is more real uh, evidence that they had. And you have to wonder why they didn't act on it. Who was in charge of, of making sure this information was filtered out? And it seems very clear to me that this was an edict from the president on down through his people that they were going to allow these rallies to happen that he was going to be there and instigate them or incite them into some kind of action so that he could essentially be carried like some Roman emperor back into the seat, essentially thought he was Caesar being carried back into the Senate, back into the streets by the people. And this is the mentality. So to hear that he sat there for hours and watched the coverage happen without doing anything, ignoring the pleas, as we found out now from his coke-addled son, Don Trump Jr., ignoring the pleas from his uh, daughter, Ivanka, and Jared Kushner, and ignoring the pleas from his sycophantic bobbleheads who work on Fox News like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson, we saw that he was ignoring everybody because he he wanted this insurrection, this coup. He wanted to see how far it was going to go. And apparently now the committee is trying to get access to the other takes of the video that he ended up finally releasing hours later after everything had essentially gone to, gone to shit that where he doesn't tell people to go home. Apparently there were a number of mm. takes of the video where he does not tell people to go home. And so you wonder, well, what was his authentic feelings? Because those first few takes are his authentic feelings. And if those feelings are saying, keep doing what you're doing, or I understand why you're doing what you're doing, blah, 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 then we've got the real answer here that this is something he knew. And I think that's why he's fighting so crazy to stop any release of the information or the texts or the phone records. It's got nothing to do with privacy, individual nonsense, bullshit. It's all about the fact that it's going to show him to be a full-on participant possibly in this whole situation well the, i mean even if there are other takes they must be terrible because even in the take that he released he said yeah. i love you yes you're great people yeah. yeah and and continued the narrative of the stolen election yeah so like i mean it was the most lame condemnation of literal violence in his capital yeah. i mean the the you know trump has revealed himself over and over again yeah. Over and over again, he's shown us who he is. He said it right out in the open, you know, way back to somebody could shoot some, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it, you know, saying knock his block off. He likes violence. Yeah. And we, and for years, people have been saying, oh, he didn't really mean that. He was just kidding. He's like, no, he meant it. At what point is everyone going to go, no, this guy means it? Yeah. Um, can we take a moment to yeah. just explain to anyone that's listening? that the election was not stolen yes, and that please. every single piece of evidence has shown that it wasn't stolen, right. that whether it's Republican secretaries of state who certified the election, yeah. whether it is Republican precinct, you know, people who ran the precincts who certified those elections, every single investigation hasn't found anything. Yeah. And here's a good clue is that if you hear someone give an explanation of how the election was stolen and then two, three weeks later, they give an entirely different explanation of how the election was stolen. Yeah. Well, then they are lying. Right. Like that is the, we don't need any outside ev evidence. If someone contradicts themselves repeatedly, well, yeah. then much of what they're saying cannot possibly be true. And even the Republican funded ninja, whatever they were in Arizona, yeah, cyber ninjas, yeah. cyber ninjas who have no experience in investigating elections whatsoever. Worst ninjas ever. Yeah. And are complete clusterfuck. They haven't found any evidence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, there literally has been no evidence. And I'm, and yet the, that is not convincing. 70% of Republicans think this thing was stolen. And, yeah. and I'm reminded continually of the Jonathan Swift quote, which is, you can't reason somebody out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. Right. Yeah, great point. Great point. That's actually, that's actually a great, great point. Uh, and I think a part of this too, Steve, you have to look at is that this is, and I, J&B brought it up here just now in one of the recent comments here, this idea of projection. 
I fully believe that what Donald Trump was doing, trying to do, was essentially election fraud. I fully believe there are people in the Republican Party who side with Donald Trump who want to commit election fraud in order to have their way. This is why they are moving Repub certain, certain Trump yeah. supporters into positions of power in local election boards, in in uh, in government. You know, uh, some of the January 6th people who attacked the Capitol who were there that day are running for Congress or running for uh, local uh, councils in their uh, cities and in their states because and state senators because they want to, in essence, um, claim that they're trying to have free and fair elections. But in actuality, they're trying to keep it so that Republicans have any semblance of power because as I said earlier, there are less and less people signing up to. I mean, a friend of mine reached out to me and wants me to run for political office here in San Diego. And he's been sending me emails. He is he is he is an assistant to one of the state senators here in, wow. in California. And he's saying to me, like, hey, these are the options that are available. We haven't found something that I 100 percent want to commit to. But he sent me the um, the registration numbers of Republicans and it has gone down in San Diego in what oh, is normally wow. known as a red state place. It has gone down and that and the problem and the Democrat numbers have gone up and it, they did a poll the other day where 68 percent of the people do not believe across the country, not just Democrats across the country, don't want Donald Trump to run for president. So what is this um, sycophantic minority that is owning this Republican Party? How bad is their situation? brother, that they are handing the keys uh, over to a person who is a really small, in, in comparison, um, following. I find this to be fascinating. I think one of the, again, these are the mistakes that the Republican Party has led themselves into. And right. one of them is it's the result of gerrymandering. Right. Because okay. because when you gerrymander, you know, the idea is like, OK, I'm going to change the map of the state. So we have concentrated uh, Republicans. Yes, that will and that will increase. And there, and if you've seen the, so, um, some scientists did some great statistical analysis of showing like how much the value of a vote is changed based on yeah. this gerrymandering, and it's huge, absolutely right. huge. You know where that if you had this a basic state election, it would be sixty percent Democratic controlled of state legislature, but yeah. in fact they have seventy five percent Republican controlled state legislature because of how it's gerrymandered. Right. But the result of that is that it means that the extreme wings of the parties gain power. Yeah, because you can't because you're going to a largely Republican district and you cannot afford to piss those people off. Mm -hmm. And so that and so what that's done is it's made those extreme wings more and more powerful. And because they're so volatile and because they bring a lot of votes, you cannot piss them off. And right. so all of these mainstream Republicans are now trapped yeah. by the situation that they've created. And that is why this small group has so much damn power mm -hmm. and and it's interesting like i would love to hear the 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 you know uh the liz cheney the all the kind of old school republican conversation of like what are they talking about right now right right because they they're fucked yeah. you know and and they're going to lose power and what's so sad is i hated dick cheney i hated carl rove oh yeah i think you know it's like <laughs> and, and, and someone po posted this in the comments a while ago of that that in terms of actual damage to the world Trump is still behind George W. Bush. True. And there, there is an argument for that. I mean, in terms yeah. of the number of people that died because Absolutely. of choices that Trump made versus choices George W. Bush made, right. George W. Bush is still winning. And yet I trust those people that I didn't like because they were at least working within the system pretty much. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I'd think that George W. Bush would have accepted him losing an election if, oh, you know, absolutely. I mean, he tried with the hanging Chad thing and got away with it, but yeah, yeah, I think he would have accepted it overall. Yes. And you know, you could argue that him winning that uh, election, which was complete and utter horseshit that he won that way, um, started us on this cycle to get to this person of Trump. Absolutely. This idea to see, they tried to take this election from us. The hanging Chad saved us. You know, this, this they use that as a thing to, uh, to, uh, keep, pushing this idea that election there is no election security that the, there's a lot of election fraud massive amounts of election fraud it's fascinating there's never been one case multiple uh, uh sorry trump appointed judges 
uh, did not agree with any of the evidence that was brought forth. Did listen to stuff and did not, and found it to be a completely not complete nonsense, complete and utter nonsense in what they were promoting. Yet these people refuse to believe it, refuse to be, refuse to see the truth because they don't want to admit that they're wrong. And it comes down to something egotistical like that. If they admit that they're wrong, that they'll be like, "Well, I wasted all this time following a person," and blah blah blah. And what we're seeing now, uh, and we'll get to your Streamlabs and Super Chats. I do want to say this. So ladies and gentlemen, the Streamlabs Super Chats are open. Please, I know we're 40 minutes into the show. I just wanted to talk about this. Jump into it. Please send in your support. If you enjoy what we're talking about, if you enjoy what we got to say, send us your thoughts and comments. We'll read them on the air. Uh, we've got 130 of you watching us right now, so please hit that like button as well. But send in your questions, thoughts, and comments through the Streamlabs, through the Super Chats. It's pinned in the chat. It's there on the screen and what have you. And I'll read the couple that we've gotten in just a second. But what you're seeing here now over and over again, Steve, is this idea that this is the only way to go. This is the only path to walk. And out of nowhere, we're finding kinship with Cheney, kinship with Rose, yeah. and something I never anticipated as we were walking through this path. And you wonder at the end of the day, where this end is because I don't know that we're going to deprogram 17 million people or more. Um, so just on the voter fraud thing, there have been a couple of cases of voter fraud. They're mostly Trump voters. Yes, like they the have dude, been mostly the, Trump voters. The dude that voted for his voted, had his dead wife vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. there, there have been a few of those. The thing that nobody ever says is they say, they say, okay, we saw these boxes move from here to there, or we saw these numbers change. Yeah. They've never made a connection of how Joe Biden was involved in this. Right. There's no, no there's no connect. They see these individual things, all of which have been disproven. Yeah. But they don't have like an email or like a memo where someone is saying how they might overthrow the government. They yeah. don't have any phone calls with Joe Biden calling up a secretary of state, <laughs> asking them to find 10,000 more votes. Right. They don't have any statements where Joe Biden says he's not going to accept the election. They don't have any any of these things. And yet, strangely enough, the person that is complaining and saying that there is fraud is the person we have actual evidence of trying to change the results of the election. Yes. Yes. And that's Donald Trump. And that's that's the Donald thing. Trump. Yeah. And this is what I come at. But in their minds, he is fighting to um, to be the rightful president because he was railroaded out of the job. That's what they see. They don't see it as election fraud, even though it walks, talks and sounds like election fraud. To them, it looks like a man who's been hard done by a system and by people who are in a massive conspiracy that no one can seem to uncover with any evidence that anything was involved, any credible evidence, and was taken out of the job. And that's the mindset that people adapt to when they are so, um, I don't know, entranced by supporting someone. And we've seen this in presidential elections. We've seen this with celebrities. We've seen this with fig any public figure. There are now people that come forward and defend them no matter what they do, no matter what madness they spew, no matter what nonsense they say, there are people that come forward and defend them. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, let's get into some of these, uh, a couple of these super chats and stream labs here. Loic um, uh, said, hey, my, op, uh, my opinion, your federal government is useless, uh, courtesy of Citizens United. You have Republicans who just want to cut all taxes for corporate donors. And just a different bunch of donors running the Democrats. There's always another mansion or cinema. Yeah, that's that's true. I guess that's true to a degree. What do you think there, Steve? Well, I think saying that our federal government is useless. The federal government is huge. It does a lot right. of stuff. It's right. not useless. It does do some things that are kind of good. Um, saying that Citizens United is one of the most destructive decisions ever to come down from the Supreme Court, I think is also true. Yeah. I also think uh, having uh, looked into Citizens United, in terms of constitutional law, there's a there's a lot of reasons why that was decided that way. Yeah, I think it was terrible that it was decided that way yeah. and hugely destructive. But I do understand why Justice Kennedy, you know, wrote that decision the way he did. Even and, and this is the mm -hmm. this is one of the really hard things about the way our system is set up is that it's like you look at the rule book that was written, you know, almost 250 years ago. Yeah, and go. Okay, well, based on this thing, then there isn't, a, and based on this, and based on this, and based on this, we have to let that thing happen, even though it's going to be fucking terrible, which yeah. is what Citizens United is. Yeah, absolutely agree there. Uh, let's see here. This is uh, Luke Hoth off podcast. Said Steve, 
Just realized it was you, legend. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Never been described as legend before. Thank you. With a little flame. That's, you, you, that's yeah. Cool. You got to say it with that British legend. You legend me. There you go. <laughs> that's how I say it. Uh, let's see. We got a stream lab that came through here from Fred Tastic314. It says, When I saw rallies at state capitals with people armed and yelling at the state police and nothing being done, I realize they believe no one will stop them no matter how high up they go. Yes, yeah, Steve, what this is a great comment from Fred Tastic314. I do want to give some give some love to Travis Earl, who just sent in a donation with no comment. Thank you, Travis. Very kind of you. But Steve, yeah, where why do you believe? I mean, Merrick Garland came out with some really strong statements yesterday saying they're going after all these people. They've got a you know, his rhetoric was a lot stronger when he came into office uh, a year ago. Now the rhetoric is more like we're doing the smaller stuff to build to the bigger stuff, but time is running out. You may think 2023 January, it seems like a year it is a year away. It seems like a long time away. It's not. It can, no. it's going to come speeding up on us at any moment, and they're the Republicans are going to obstru obstruct this a uh, committee and it's do and what it's trying to do as soon as they possibly can. So you wonder uh, in this situation why they're not moving fast enough, and do you believe they're going to go all the way to the tippy top? Here's the thing I don't get. Imagine there was somebody who was a witness to, let's say, a, a small robbery at a liquor store. It stole sure. 50 bucks. And the courts, the, the prosecution subpoenaed them. And they said, you know what? I don't feel like going. What do you think could happen to that person? Yeah. <laughs> they get arrested. Exactly. They'd be in contempt of court and they would immediately be arrested because you can't not respond to a subpoena. And right. yet somehow when the situation is far more dire and far more serious, you could just go, nah, I don't feel like talking about that thing. Right. I don't understand how that is possible. Right. I don't understand how this is not that this is the fucking Congress of the mm -hmm. United States. This is supposed to be the most important, most powerful of the three bodies of government. That's how it was yeah. set up. It right. actually isn't that way at this point, but it was supposed to be, and that they can't just say no, Steve Bannon, no, you know, like you have to come. Mark Meadows. Mark yeah. Meadows right now and answer every question that we ask you yeah. because literally there was an attempt to overthrow the government. I do not understand. And you're 100% right. A year is not a long time. Yeah. These wheels turn real, real slow. And in all likelihood at this moment, we're going to lose possibly both houses. Yeah. And that means that the Republic, you think the Republicans are going to continue any of these investigations? They'll no. just go over yeah absolutely and biden's going to be his hands are going to be tied completely for yep. the last two years of his presidency and from what we're seeing so far there ain't going to be a second term and that's no. kind of unsettling to think about um you know the violence resulted in five deaths and 175 injuries and then a number of police officers who were there that day killing themselves afterwards no. from the uh what they went through the trauma that they went through but still you have uh, fox news bobbleheads making fun of people's feelings this is the kind of nonsense that we're dealing with five people died that's one more than benghazi ladies and gentlemen one more than benghazi but weird but republicans are not willing to dive in and look at all of this and the reason they don't want to look at all this is because it's their voters it was their voters who were there that day. It was their voters who were there uh, climbing barricades and bursting through, showing up with zip ties, showing up with, uh, with a, a, a noose to hang Mike Pence, all of that. And then Mike Pence, of course, coming out now over the last few weeks and saying it was just one day, as if this just came out of nowhere, as if there was this wasn't something they'd been building to. And once again, this political narrative of not holding people to account because it is politically expedient for them or convenient for them so they can maintain power. This is such a terrible um, uh, uh, relationship that they are developing with these people that's not going to end well. And Steve, we're even seeing it now amongst the social media platforms that these conservatives, for lack of a better term, these more MAGA nuts have created here. They're fighting amongst themselves and accusing each other of being CIA created um, uh, social media sites. So even when there isn't an overwhelming thing to fight, they will look to fight amongst themselves. These are snakes in a pit. Um, on, on, in terms of the media and the hypocrisy there, it's yeah. like I always, I always, and I, 
if I give any piece of advice to people listening right now or watching is that use the consistency test, right? Look at what they said about this thing and see if they say the same thing when the tables have turned. So during the George Floyd protest, we heard from conservative media over and over and over yeah. again, the need to respect the police, that any violence should be re you know, reacted to with violence, that the, that the uh, pressure against the protesters, whether it was tear gas or rubber bullets, that that was justified. And then when we have the, insurrection they turn around and say oh no that what you know we have uh, ashley babbitt or whatever her name is right as a victim it's like it's like look i don't know exactly what happened in the moment that uh that she was shot but i i can say that looking at what was going on yeah. it is shocking that more people weren't shot and the fact is is that if this had been a black lives matter protest and you had people charging the police and throwing them on the ground and hitting yeah. them with bear spray and beating them with flags that fox news would have been like shoot them all oh my god yeah oh absolutely fox would have been advocate i mean there jesse waters came out and essentially advocated the the, uh, the assassination of dr fauci at, at the convention at what, what it was a cpac or whatever that was the other day i mean this is the kind of madness that for those fat cats who are sitting there as talking heads, collecting their money, living in their ivory towers with their 10 cars and, you know, got all their, they're not going to come down to the ground level and have these fights. So they have no problem spouting all kinds of madness and nonsense because they think it's not going to touch them. But I guarantee you, the more you create this monster, the stupider you are in thinking that it can be controlled and that it yep. won't touch you or come after you the second jackie jesse waters has a hesitation they will come and eviscerate him i mean today on these uh, uh, uh conservative news news outlets um marjorie taylor green was on i think with bannon or one of these other people and they went after ted cruz for saying what he said right after january 6th they, in a number of outlets they went after ted cruz for him calling it a violent i mean imagine that him ted cruz one of the most non-truth tellers in the world actually having a, an epiphany or a moment of lucidity and saying a truthful thing that this was a violent attack by domestic terrorists, this is what they're coming after. For. And this was domestic terrorism. That's what this was. Now, does everybody showed up at that rally? Are they a domestic terrorist? No, absolutely not. But the people that broke through those uh, through those barriers, walked in the cab, smashed windows, hunted down congressmen and women, went in their arm to the teeth, and they were armed. They had rounds. They had knives. They had batons. They had these apparently these long electric prods that they were using to hit the police with. There was all of that that was there. Those are the domestic terrorists. I want that to be very, very clear. You have a right to peacefully protest whatever you want peacefully. The second you cross that line and you start to uh, 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 commit violence, as Merrick, uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland said yesterday, that's the moment you cross the line into, into criminal activity and should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. You know, in my opinion, dude, they're giving out these really weak-ass sentences. I want people in jail for years for what they did that day on the Capitol. I get being caught up in the swell of the moment, but if you came armed to the teeth with rounds, bombs, yeah. and zip ties, you should be put in jail for years. There's years. Th 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 that's clear, very clear. I agree 100%. If you came prepared, you can't say, oh, I was caught up in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like, you came armed. Yeah. That's the first thing. I, I would, I, I want to just say, like, to continue to go, like, use this consistency test yeah. because Trump would say, this person is the best person in the world. I have the best people. They're great right. people. And then we'll turn around and attack those people when they do what they don't like. And yeah. that is like, well, either they weren't the best people and you didn't really like them right. or you're wrong. Now you can't be right when you do two contradictory things. Right. That, that that's one thing. The, the, the other thing is I want it's, we, there's a lot of issues with language and one of the things is is that it's like we've lost track of the difference between metaphorical language yeah. and actual literal language so if you and i say <clears throat> john you and i we're going to take aim at the opposition we're going to blow them away <sighs> no one thinks that we're going to get guns and yeah. put our sights on someone and shoot them we are speaking metaphorically right. but if you have a sign that says hang mike pence and a noose that's not a metaphor that and is not yeah right and you're chanting it yeah. that is not a metaphor we're not in the realm of metaphors when you're talking about assassinating anthony fauci fauci yeah. not a metaphor when these congress people get call phone calls saying i'm going to come to ha your house and kill your children and rape your wife 
These are not metaphorical speech. Yeah. These are physical violent threats and they should not be tolerated in any way. Yeah, and I think we've got to look, you've got to handle you got to handle strength with strength. And I think we're as much as I respect Merrick Garland is in his accomplishments in the courts as a lawyer and as a judge and in, in the court systems. I also think by the other side of this, we need to be handling this with a much harder hand. This idea that we keep thinking we're going to walk people back from this mania is what's stopping people from doing the more harder decisions, making the more harder judgments. And we're seeing judges who, in essence, because these are almost all white people that are being arrested, these white judges are being very lenient towards these. these some of these conservative judges are being lenient towards the punishment of this kind of stuff. And that, to me, is getting me frustrated as well, because I agree with you. I mean, if this was, I guarantee you, if this was a BLM protest, there is no way the National oh, yeah. Guard isn't there immediately. There is no way. I mean, look at what Trump did to clean out that area when he wanted to take his photo up in front of the church. They sent, they were shooting rubber bullets in the crowd with tear gas. There's no effing way they weren't using real bullets if, pe if uh, uh, people of color or people in the Black Lives Matter movement had breached the Capitol in protest of Trump's oh, yeah. election. And there's no effing way that wouldn't have happened. And that's the sad truth of it. You talk, yeah, when you talk about the reverse of it, there, this would have, and Trump would have had people hanging from gallows. Absolutely would have brought back public execution. And his Republican colleagues would have walked in lockstep with him to allow it to happen in the House and the Senate. And that's sad i think at that point they're walking in goose step with him yeah fair that's fair um the the yeah i i and if you look at when trump cleared out that park they're just sitting there yeah they're, they're just having a literal peaceful protest there is right. nobody attacking the police there's right. nobody doing and what's so sad too is that you heard all of the uh all of the talk about supporting the police and right. i am certain that during the blm protests all sorts of the people that later attacked the Capitol were saying, got to support those cops. You got to support the police. Yeah. And those are the same people that are screaming the N word at an officer who's oh, sure. down on the ground begging for his life. Yeah. Yep. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. Secular Monk says Republican obstruction is a huge reason why the 2022 midterms are so important. If Democrats don't change the voting rules on the filibuster, then it sets up the Republicans for 2024. Yeah, it's a thousand percent the truth. You saw Manchin come out earlier this week and say he is not going to support this idea of changing the voting rules on the filibuster. You know, cinema isn't as well. And it's, you know, we, we, we've already found out all the information we need to know on Kristen Cinema and her being backed by Republican donors, by big pharma donors. She's essentially a Republican Democrat clothing. And so is Manchin. They're both people who are just essentially Republicans uh, in in or Democrats in name only. You dinos. Hey, dinos. Dinos. Uh, and, and that to me is is what's sad here. But you don't see, as I said earlier, you don't see Joe Biden trying to unseat either one of those two people or advocate for them to be uh, primary as soon as possible or whatever. So what we're seeing here is I agree with you. I think these midterms, I think seeing these people moving into positions of power on the Republican side of things, they're going to start throwing out Democratic ballots in mass. And we're going to have massive um, uh, court cases that are going to tie up the courts. It's going to be insane, Steve, if this is allowed to happen. And it's frustrating that we're letting this happen uh, and I think people still are under the belief that somehow people are going to come back from the brink of this madness. And they're not. They're going to thumb on Louise themselves right over the fucking cliff on this shit. Um, unfortunately, I think we're really in a rock and a hard place when it comes to the filibuster. And mm -hmm. I don't think that we should change the rules on the filibuster right now because we're about to lose the House and the Senate. Yeah. And, and and it's like if we had a guarantee, if we had a five seat or a 10 seat, a five seat majority in the Senate and a 25 seat majority in the House, well, then we could get this voting bill through. Yeah. But with with the current majority, even if we change the filibuster rules, Manchin's still going to vote against it. Yeah. So it actually doesn't help us. And so what you've done then is handed the Republicans way more power. And what we've seen, even though this sort of reduction of the rules of the Senate probably started with Harry Reid, with a Democrat who, right. yeah. who, who changed things. That was sort of the first one yeah. to allow 50-50 uh, votes or 51, uh, just a simple majority to get judges in. Mm -hmm. In every step, 
the Republicans have used these changes in rules more aggressively and yep. more successfully. Mm -hmm. And so if we go, hey, we're going to get rid of the filibuster, then fail to actually pass this voting rights law, yeah. fail probably to pass Build Back Better, and then the Republicans take the House and the Senate, then we are really, really, really fucked. Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent point, Steve, for sure. Where is the great motivator in the Republican Party? I mean, Joe Biden is not doing it. Uh, Ka Kamala Harris seems uh, like a ghost there. Where is she? And there's nobody. And Pelosi doesn't inspire anybody. So it's just like, where is the great? I mean, AOC is really the only one who's really doing it. And we need more of that kind of political power in the hands of Democrats who understand how to use social media, who understand how to use their time in front of the camera, who understand how to motivate people and inspire people to vote Democrat and push back against any of these Republican-led uh, um, efforts to remove the ability of people to vote uh, in, in free and fair elections at higher numbers. This is what they're afraid of. The, and, and Trump has said it numerous. He said the quiet part out loud numerous times. Oh, if, yeah. If more people get to vote, Republicans will never be in power again. And that's the truth. So this is all just a desperate attempt to hold on to some semblance of power in a society that no longer wants you to represent them. And they don't want to understand it. Instead of evolving their points of views, they've regressed back to the Stone Age with Trump in a desperate attempt to try to hold on to this country. And something is going to break. Please don't believe that Democrats are sitting there hugging trees and growing their hair out, walking around in flip-flops and saying peace with flowers. Democrats have changed. Democrats are much more hardcore than these Republicans actually believe. And when this shit goes down, if it goes down, it's going to surprise a lot of people. Don't forget that the same flower power people got so disillusioned by not having by by the fact that Republicans pushed back against them like Nixon and all of them, that they became domestic terrorists in setting bombs. Yeah. And that scares me. That scares me because that's an actual path that Democrats have walked. Liberal Democrats have walked. And so we're going to get it on both sides. And even the person that they can't find that person who who uh, planted bombs on January 6th at both the RNC and the DNC. That tells you that this there is a very real movement to destroy both sides of this thing uh, in brutal fashion. And that's scary. I, I'm glad you brought up sort of what happened in the early 70s in the aftermath of yeah. the hippie movement, because I think and maybe this is somewhat hopeful is that all of us go, we're in this horrible, unique moment where everybody hates each other and where we're worried about the rise of violence. Right. And it's not actually as unique as you think it is. Is that, yeah. is that, you know, that's why I'm really glad you brought it up is that there was this moment where there were all sorts of extreme left wing terrorist organizations who were blowing shit up yeah. in the early 70s. And that's yeah. a really scary thing. And yet we managed to get past it. The other thing though is that. You know, you mentioned like what where is the leader? I think part of the problem is is that Trump changed all the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, we've never had to deal with someone like this because there was always people would always, even people you didn't like would say kind of the right things. Yeah. So if somebody died, the president would say the things that you say when someone dies, right. even if it was someone they didn't like. John McCain dies. Trump says horrible things about him. Yeah. You know, like if there was a natural disaster, the president goes and says, hey, we're all one country and work together. Trump sees a natural disaster in a state he doesn't like. He says, I don't care. Yeah. You know, Not like instead of anybody. Yeah. yeah. And so it's so because he doesn't behave in any way that's predictable. And because also our entire world of communications has shifted so much in the last decade mm -hmm. that and he's managed to he knows how to play that stuff perfectly. Yeah. Well, that's that makes it really, really hard to figure out how to play against him. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if AOC was male, if this would be a whole different ball game, to be honest with you. And I, I not that she's not phenomenal and, and powerful within her own right. I just wonder if she was male, what would be the reaction? What would be the possibilities here? And so I hope, and you said, I see people, Ted Liu, Ted Liu. Yeah, he's fine, but he's not, He's not going to galvanize a whole country, no. man. You've got to find that person like Clinton, like Kennedy, who galvanizes the Democratic base and motivates, or like Obama, for lack Obama, of a better yeah. term. And, and the thing is, I, I mean, and I think it's fair to kind of criticize President Obama for not being more vocal through the four years of Trump. He should have been out there, and he should be out there now. 
to be honest with you, and 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 campaigning him and Michelle need to be out there in more forceful ways, need to be out there in more powerful ways, more open ways, more vibrant ways. But of course, maybe there's a fear, of course, with the with the atmosphere of violence that something terrible could happen to both of them, which none of us would want. And so maybe there's a hesitation there for them. So it's 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 weird. It's like you're playing chess. And the other team you thought was really stupid, they've somehow found a way to kind of pin you in corners, and you're wondering how the hell you get out of there without well, having to blow the whole fucking chessboard up. I think it's like you're playing chess and they're in, you know, the WWF. You know, <laughs> that's that, that's what's going on. I think, and I, and again, I think that's actually fucking perfect. <laughs> I think Obama um, was obeying the rules of the way things had been done. Yes, of course. Which is that a, a, a past president doesn't mess yeah. around with the new president yeah they they say which is again it's people saying the stuff you're supposed to say i wish president trump the best of luck and god bless him and we really all of america has to come together because that's what you always say right and that is playing into trump's hands yeah because yeah. he's going to take advantage of that and i think you know halfway through his administration people started to figure out like oh we can't do that stuff anymore right um but at the beginning they certainly didn't i mean and i understand it like the decisions about investigating russia the decisions about the hillary email stuff that happened mm -hmm. right before trump was elected those were impossible decisions yeah, yeah you know because if obama had come out with more information about russia before the election it would look like he was trying to sabotage trump right you know if right. the fbi had withheld the stuff about hillary clinton even though it was fucking meaningless yes that would have looked like he was trying to support hillary clinton and so they made these decisions to try to appear that they were being fair yeah and that just helps a person who doesn't give a shit about being fair. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the absolute truth, which is, which is a shame for sure. Uh, let's see what we've got here from um, uh, Loic, L-O-I-C. As a Canadian, we have our issues. You guys are faked. The state level laws are really changing major cultural issues while at the federal level, it's cultural issues on one side and crickets on the other. Yeah. Steve, what do you think about that? Um, I, I'm not sure what, what it means, the cultural issues on one side and crickets on the other. Um, so I'm not sure if I understand the question. I, I think yeah. he's more saying that like there are there's one side that is trumpeting for social issues and change and mm. that for people of color and LGBTQ people to have uh, more, their rights more recognized and seen as equals in this country. And the other side could give two shits about them. That's the silence. That's the crickets, I think, is what he's trying to say. And that's the problem. I think um, I wish that we were actually having a discussion about these issues, but we're not, Yeah, no, nope. you know, because it's just, there's just, ex because what has happened is that each side characterizes the other side as evil and you can't have a discussion with evil. Yeah. You know, that's true. Um, uh, because I think there are discuss because these aren't, you know, black and white issues. These are yep. complicated issues yep. and how we deal with, you know, like if we were to say, uh, you know, that we want to help with minority rights. And we said, OK, from now on, for the next year, only minorities will be hired. No white people will be hired in any job anywhere ever. We mm -hmm. would go. That might be a little too far. Yeah. You know, and yet if we said, let's just keep going as we're going and not ha not do any work to help minorities and underserved communities to get hired, we yeah. might go, eh, that seems like we're not doing enough. And now we could have like a discussion about, well, how do we approach these things? What are the right. real issues? Yeah. How does systemic racism work? What how does it affect people and actually have a conversation? We might get somewhere, but we, we're yeah. not having those conversations. No, that's a very good point, Steve. Absolutely. Uh, we've got two more that have come in here from Streamlabs side of things. And ladies and gentlemen, please keep sending in your Streamlabs and Super Chats. You know, we're talking on here. we got well over 100 of you joining us here live. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please make sure you hit that like button, but send in your support as well. If you enjoy the fact that we're doing this, support the Outlaw Nation uh, for all the shows we're doing and uh, send us in your questions, thoughts, and comments to Streamlabs address right there on the screen. Also in the uh, in the chat here, it's pinned in the chat and in the description of this video. Uh, Doug Developer, speaking of Streamlabs, he sent us one. He said, what the hell is Garland doing, says Doug? I think Democrats in general need to be tougher and play more hardball like McConnell does. I hate to admit it. Do you also think Democrats are being too soft? Yes, yeah, Steve, what's your feeling? Do you think Democrats are being too soft? You think we're being too kumbaya? What do you think's going on? I think we lack leadership. I yeah. think it's what you said before. Yeah. Um, I think, and, and, and this is it, is that I believe in carrots and sticks, and I believe that it should be a 
here is how we would like to work with you and be nice and soft. And if you don't do this, this is the big fucking stick that's going to happen. Right. And this is the consequences. Figuratively. Right. right. Yes. Figure again, metaphorical. I just, language. you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been misquoted <laughs> on podcasts yeah. and misquoted on shows. So I like to be very clear about certain points so that other people don't clip stuff out and use it for their own fucking benefit. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that's it. So, so, mm -hmm. and I do think, you know, we've always been in my lifetime, the party of the big tent. And that means yeah. you got a lot of people like you got Joe Manchin and you got AOC and that's, right. they're real, real far apart. Yeah. And so figuring what I'll tell you, the big thing that I wish is that, and it's not possible in the way that our part two party system has evolved mm -hmm. is it used to be that a rural Democrat and a rural Republican might get together to pass a small piece of legislation about farm rights. Yeah. Because in that small area, they're totally in agreement. Yeah. You know, um, or or a business person in, who's a Republican and pro-business person who's a Democrat, they could make a deal together. Yeah. Today, it's almost essentially, it's like 98% that people vote the party line. Yeah. And because it's 98% that people vote the party line, the only way to get something passed is through these reconciliation bills you know, and what that means is you have to put everything in one giant bill. Mm -hmm. And that's just made it hugely destructive. It's made it impossible to like make a deal yeah. and actually get anything done. And that right. is just, I, and that, that to me is the big thing that I wish could change. I actually, I mean, what I would love, and it's not going to happen, is I would like there to be four parties. I would like there to be, sure. I mean, I don't want there to be a Trump party, but let's mm -hmm. say there's a party at the extreme right. And then there's the old school Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney, Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And then there is the Joe Biden Democratic Party. And then there's the, you know, Bernie Sanders AOC party. And we have right. these four parties and they would balance each other out and they would be forced to make deals and compromises. And we would have a system that might work a lot more efficiently, but we can't. But but they're all too scared because if yeah. a party splits, they lose all their power. Right. Unless both parties split. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I feel like the parties are splitting anyway within themselves, you know, for the, I think there are a lot of people who feel the way that Liz Cheney and Adam Kinziger feel. And, and there are people who feel the way Trump uh, and the MAGA nuts feel. And, and on the other side, there's the people who side with Manchin and the democratic side of things. And there are people who side with AOC and the democratic side of things. So right. I think that four party system is, in operation within a two-party system um and it's affecting who wins and who loses yeah. because of the split within their own parties their own massive parties yeah yeah um let's see here we got another one that came in for, and thank you doug for sending that in keep sending in your stream lab super chats as we go along here aaron what's up brother aaron clister's up in here uh he said uh the outlaw wears the guy fox mask and v for vendetta looks like a blueprint into america's future oh god uh, R for redemp Roca for redemption is the real world scenario. I don't follow today's politics, but you two are bringing up great points. I'm nervous for my son's future. Yeah. Aaron has a young child, a baby in essence. Yeah. Uh, and thinking about, I didn't even think about, you know, cause we haven't had kids and we're not going to have kids in my, and you, I know you have a young son and in my mind, I haven't even thought about what this must be like for a parent to watch as they see, they want a future where the kids get along but see the uh, what the adults are doing with the current present that they have. I I think about my dad, who was a Boy Scout. He's an Eagle Scout. My dad was as straight and narrow a person as you could possibly imagine. Yeah, he was a you pay your taxes, you go to work, you help the community. That's the kind of person he was. Yeah, and I think of what my dad would tell me about what America is, and I think about what he would say now. You know, that yeah. I can't actually tell my kid the story of America that my dad would have told me, you right. know, yeah. that that this is a great nation. That's a, a nation that has, believes in democratic principles, that has honor, that is. And of course, all, we've always known that those things were not really always true. Transitory at times. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 you believed in the dream. I remember, you know, you and I done a bunch of movies in the cinephiles that were kind of more patriotic. I remember when we did the right stuff mm. and the right stuff is all about the space race. And is that the guys who were the astronauts, they weren't really the paragons of virtues that they were being presented as. Right. They, that wasn't exactly true, but it was important to present them that way because they became heroes. Yeah. They became things that we could believe in and believing in those heroes is what strengthens our country. Yeah. When you just tear down all the heroes and then you go, Oh, it's all, it's all bullshit. Well, then our country, the country itself gets weaker. 
Yeah. And that's what we're seeing now. Cause like I said, at the very beginning, we're losing faith. Yeah, absolutely. Um, soul, uh, one of my uh, patrons, one of my dear friends here says, I always think about what my grandparents would think about what America is now. They are no longer with us, but they sacrificed to come to this country for the American dream. Yeah, you know, Soul, as a son of immigrants myself, I absolutely understand you. Having lost my father in 2010, he loved this country, loved this country. Yeah. My mother, still alive, loves this country. Uh, you know, they've only, they only visited their homeland two or three times in their entire lifetime because wow. they loved this country so much. And so um, I think about them, but also I think about um, Americans who have grandparents who fought in the in the World War II? Yeah. Who fought against this kind of fascism that Trump is advocating? This kind of uh, fascism that the uh, MAGA Republican-led party is is uh, is is uh, wanting to put into motion? Uh, the Nazism, the fact that these are people walking around with Nazi armbands, and you've got a president who said that there are good people on both sides. That kind of nonsense. This is the kind of thing that's an insult to the greatest generation and their sacrifices that they made in that war uh, that was supposed to be the last world war that we ever had. And so I find this to be a fascinating thing that the generate the uh, descendants and sometimes the sons and daughters of these people insult their legacy, insult their sacrifice by aligning themselves with someone like Trump, who would gladly lead a Nazi party to power if it meant he got to be president. Trump doesn't seem to really have any principles other than Donald Trump. Yeah, true. You know, I mean, that's so whatever, whatever method gets him to, you know, the other thing, by the way, I don't even think he likes being president. <laughs> no, I, it just likes winning. He likes winning. He wants to be, he wants to like be the president. center of everything. He doesn't like that job. It's too restrictive. All. Right. Yeah. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't even like the white house. You know, the plumbing's no. bad. The, he doesn't He's like the deck golf yeah. every weekend. Yeah, he, he likes Mar-a-Lago. Like, that's yeah. what's so hilarious about the whole thing. I mean, the, the big thing to me is, is I wish, you know, it's, it's come up over and over again in the cinephiles when you and I are discussing something, is I always yeah. am like, well, let's define our terms. What do we mean <laughs> when we say this is a classic film? What are we saying yeah. when this is a B-movie? Well, when you say you love America, what do you mean? Right. What is it about America that you love? Yeah. And define your, because then again, then we could have a conversation. Right. But when people go like, well, there's the real America and they only are, you know, the, the states in the middle. Well, there's a whole, you're saying that New York, our largest city, that that's not real America or LA, right. the next largest city that we're not real America. Like that's all America. I would yeah. never say that some guy living in Arkansas is not a real American. He mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the whole, cause to me, part of the value is diversity like yeah. i actually think you know if you list the things that make america great one of them is that we're incredibly diverse yeah that is one of our big stats so so now i'm putting that out that's something i love about america mm -hmm. and i wish the other side would say okay well this is something i love about america because sometimes we might have more in common than we think you right. know right Right. But I mean, doesn't the rhetoric fall apart, though, when you've got them embracing something as infantile as the let's go Brandon phrase? I mean, this is something which, that... by the way, came up on our chat. I don't know if you saw it. Oh, no. Did someone? Uh, yeah, mention we, that? yeah, we had a let's go Brandon go by a while. Ago. Oh, we did. <laughs> of course. Yeah. We did. Yeah. That's fine. It, passing through. But yeah, those kinds of things, you, you look at that and you go, this is not these aren't adults. The yeah. snickering let's go. I mean, uh, Lauren Boebert, who is essentially just a, a frustrated, sad a um, uh, person desperate for attention uh, with a husband who exposed himself to a young, to a minor uh, is out here wearing, you know, these dresses that say, let's go Brandon to try to kind of stick it in the, uh, uh, the face of the libs. But th this is childish behavior. This is childish. This is high school behavior that is happening. And here is um, someone like Kaylee McEnany, who, who was an utter joke as a press secretary for Trump going on Fox News or Newsmax, one of those uh, is, is things the other day, and saying that uh, AOC's tweet about these sexually frustrated Republicans who want to kill her or have sex with her, saying that she should say comments that are befitting a congresswoman in the United States Congress, but says not one fucking word about Lauren Boebert and her and Marjorie Taylor Greene embracing the Let's Go Brandon or Marjorie Taylor Greene confronting these women on the steps of the Capitol, these fellow Congress women who are advocating for the uh, for pro-choice uh, in uh, pro-choice reforms 
in the Senate. And, and imagine that, that this is childish behavior happening from those two women. AOC is as far away from childish as you can get, but those two are the judge, but they will not call them out for that kind of behavior. Cr Dan Crenshaw did. And people started turning on him like crazy that he had to put some video out where he was like making fun of Biden. So it's just, it's crazy. I, again, I'm going to go right back again and again yeah. and again to consistency is like, if you call out a behavior on one person and ignore the behavior on the person on your side, well, then that's something that should be examined. And I, and I, and I also go back to what are the conversations, you know, between Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham about Marjorie Taylor Greene? You know, like, yeah, yeah. like they're going like, what the fuck has happened? Right. You know, I'm sure they, McCarthy and, is like, God, fuck, I'm sure he's like the teacher in the romper room, dude. Yeah. And yet, and yet he's still buckling under, yes. you know, like, you know, you, you, cause we heard there are all the quotes from all of them on January 6th and the few days after condemning yeah. Trump, sure. you know, Lindsey Graham says that's enough. We're done. You know, all of them did. And then all of them are right back there yeah. licking his boots, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because they saw the reactions from their base to them saying negative things about Trump, even after the insurrection on January 6th, and they went running back to Trump on their hands and knees. McConnell's the only one that hasn't done it, Mitch McConnell. But then again, in some ways, he's kind of pushed forward the policies of Trump in the Senate. But um, but McCarthy ran back to him. What's his face? Um, uh, Cruz ran back to him. Right. All these people ran. Uh, all these people ran back to him to kiss the ring. Yeah, Lindsey Graham to to kiss the ring and. It's, a, it's just sad. I mean, we've got someone like Paul Gosar, the representative who's putting up anime of, of cutting off AOC's head. Like, what is yeah. what is this madness? What is this madness? And do you want the violence? Because I guarantee you, the violence is not going to stop in the streets. And that's the dangerous part of this. When you foment violence, there is no way to control that violence. There isn't. I don't care if you have the army or the National Guard or whatever. There's no way to control it. As I said, it was the liberals who became domestic terrorists, the hippie, hippie people, the flower power, disillusioned by the lies of Republican administrations like Nixon's who became these domestic terrorists. And if you think you're going to get away with this stuff and not have some kind of violence come back your way, you're insane. You know, you, it beget, violence begets more violence. That's just the natural course of things. So I don't understand the mentality that think they're going to win by that tactic. They're not. Americans are resilient, whether they're Democratic or Republican, Steve. There's no fucking way they're gonna take they're gonna take it lying down. There's no way. Well, and again, now in in, in to because and I don't want that to happen. I want to clarify. I don't want yes, that to of happen. Of course, of course. Yeah. Like that the video, the animated video of uh yeah. of Gozar and AOC. So here's the thing for consistency. When Trump got elected president, uh a liberal, Kathy Griffin, held up his decapitated head. Right. So I will say that was fucked up. Yeah. Just as I say, the animated video was fucked up. There yeah. is a, because we get to this point of like, this doesn't feel like a metaphor. We're mm -hmm. not just making a joke. When you hold up like the decapitated bloody head of the president and you think that's cool. Well, that's not, we're in the realm of not joke now. Right. And I think that animated video, that's not really a joke. There are people yeah. that are see that will go, yeah, let's kill her. Yeah. You know, and, and we're and, trying to do that on January 6th, the year well, ago. Well, and this is a person when someone is getting death threats and has to have ex extra security, which AOC does, mm -hmm. this isn't funny. You yeah. know, yeah. it's not a funny thing. Or someone like Representative Ilhan Omar, who has to deal with the lies that Boebert makes up about her carrying a backpack or and then the disgusting fact that she called and wanted to double down on her lies and then yeah. issue that. I mean, they're they just use people for props. There's no then they walk to church. And, and ask God for their blessing. And it's like, what are you doing? What's the hypocrisy of what you're doing? You are essentially going after these people and, and treating them like lesser than you. And, and then you want to walk in front of God. First of all, God is not white. Second of all, God is not going to be, and I, as a Christian myself, as a believer in God myself, he is not going to ordain or bless the terrible actions that Lauren Boebert is doing that uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing, Go Gosar is doing, hell fucking no. That is not in his um, desire to see that. It's a, a memory of whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers as you do unto me. So Gosar, if you see AOC as the least of us as human beings or as Democrats or liberals or whatever you want to call it, then you are doing to her what you would do to God. 
That's the natural course of belief here. That's why these lessons are so important, but they conveniently pick and choose what lessons they want to believe in, in the world of Christianity, religion, or God. And it's a joke. It's an utter joke. Well, the idea that religious people have occasionally been hypocritical, <laughs> I think it's happened very, very rarely. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> I mean, I am, I am a Jewish atheist. But I've read the Bible. I know enough about Jesus to know that there's some real basic things we could say yeah. about what his beliefs are. Yes. Anti-rich, rich man, yes. easier for a rich man to get through an eye of a needle than a, I'm, I'm sorry, easy for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Yep. That's pretty clear. Whipped Cared them out of the, the temple. Poor. He whipped them out of yeah. the temple. Yep. Yeah, Didn't, exactly. wasn't a big into business. Yep. Cared about poor people. Didn't like violence and believed in forgiveness and compassion and kindness. Those are the big Jesus things. Right. Now, I personally don't believe that he was the Messiah or the right. son of God, but I really like those things. Yep. He is one of my philosophical heroes. And so if you are carrying around a gun for Jesus, you probably didn't read that book real carefully. Yeah. You know, and, and the same thing I'll say about America. There are, in my opinion, certain core beliefs and freedom of religion freedom to practice the religion of your choice yeah. is it's it's in the number one position you know it's mm -hmm. the first amendment to the constitution and so if you don't believe if you believe this is a christian only country or you don't believe that someone can be a practicing muslim and be an american yeah. then again you didn't read the constitution real well exactly. you don't understand what the, and then and this is again what i mean by let's talk about values do you believe that people should be able to practice whatever religion they want in this country, or do you not? Yeah. And if you do, then you must protect that Muslim as much as you protect Jewish people like me or Christian people or Buddhists. It doesn't matter. They have the right to do that. And so to look at a congresswoman and say, oh, you're a terrorist because you're a Muslim, that is a complete misunderstanding of what America is supposed to be about. It's un-American. A hundred percent. In my opinion, yeah. Un-American. Yeah. No, it just is. I don't think there's an yeah. opinion. Here. Objectively, this is un-American. Uh, Josh Mabry sent in. Thank you, Josh, for the very kind donation. It says, as a conservative who doesn't like Trump but loves the outlaw nation. <laughs> thank you, Josh. I'm totally embarrassed what happened uh, then. I'm, I'm assuming he means January 6th. The problem is I can't trust government at all. Biden just seems so super reactionary and doesn't come through on his promises. Josh, I, I have to push back a little bit. On the super, I, my problem with Biden is that he's not reactionary enough, and so I find that to be fascinating. I would love your clarification on what you mean by super reactionary. I want to understand what you see as super reactionary and kind of get into your see it through your eyes. Um, and does it come through in his promises? That is very true. There were a number of promises, but then again, I mean, is it because of legislation? Is it because Mansion and Cinema are holding him back? What? Why do you think this is? happening what, what do you think steve about josh's comments here well, well first of all the idea that you're gonna say oh well that uh president or politician didn't come through on all of his promises therefore he's a bad person it's like no president or politician comes yeah. through on all his promises True. and to say that he wasn't trying because i mean the size of these bills when they first started out yeah he was trying to do some things that were the most probably among the most transformative things in the history of the united states yeah, yeah, he yeah. didn't get them all I, you know, and I'm not sure that I would have wanted him to get them all. Yeah. Uh, also, I don't think I would call him re reactionary either. That doesn't seem like the right word for him. Yeah. I think that the, he has been a mixed bag. I think that uh, the, I think we absolutely was correct to leave Afghanistan. I think that yeah. we weren't serving a good purpose there anymore. Um, and I think the way that we left Afghanistan was an absolute travesty. And that mm -hmm. is entirely on Biden's. That was his plan. Yep. You know, yep. like that, that was, you know, and so like, do I believe he did a better job of spreading information about COVID and vaccines than Trump did? hundred percent. Mm -hmm. I do. Do I think that he was caught off guard by Omicron and that we don't have the number of tests right. that we should have a hundred percent. So it's like, and, and again, I'm going to put out another rule. One of my rules is consistency. Look, if people say things consistently about their side and the other side, yeah. here's another one is if people criticize their own team, you can trust them more than people that never criticize their own team. Mm. Is that I can look at Joe Biden and say, well, I like some of these things and I yeah. don't like other of these things. Yeah. You know, that if, if you just say everything Trump does is great, well, then I have no interest in you. You obviously are not paying attention. Right. You right. know.
Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and as I said, please clarify when you can. You don't have to send another donation if you want to just clarify in the chat. I will look for it, my friend. J and B giving you some love says Steve Morris has become my favorite Jewish person, recently surpassing <laughs> John Stewart and Tony Kornheiser. That's a hell of a wow. twosome to pass, Steve. Damn. That's, don't tell John Stewart. He's going to be really upset. <laughs> that, thank you. That is the that is the nicest, strangest compliment I have gotten in a long time. <laughs> JMB also adding a, a counter to my God argument saying, well, he did flood us that one time though. Yeah. Well, well, true. Fair point. Fair Listen, point. as, 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 as your favorite Jewish person and be believing in the old Testament or yeah. the Torah, <laughs> God does a lot of messed up stuff. Yeah. See, that's a, I'm a new Testament guy. I'm a new yeah. Testament. Guy. It gets a lot know. kinder and gentler in the new Testament. <laughs> Until right. you get to revelations and then man, oh. it's, then some it's all stuff crazy. in there too which you may, may be seeing soon from what oh, i see Jesus. out of the streets god help us all well uh, travis earl saying no love for larry david oh all right well jmb re revisit your feelings about listen larry. there are a lot of great jews out there i'm just saying <laughs> that's true there are as, as an honorary jew you I are an honorary you jew yeah as an anti-dentite i can tell you that <laughs> um yeah I, something here i like this uh i think biden should have been elected at a younger age maybe it would have been better maybe Maybe, but then again, remember at a younger age is when he passed that uh, really controversial law that put uh, black people in jail, the yeah. crime bill. Yeah, that was really controversial and had he had really worked to get the black community back on his side uh, when he ran for student loans. And Josh uh, clarifies, to go, why hasn't he got rid of student loans? Yeah, Josh, this is a, a, a very valid question and it's an interesting exploration here. What is the issue? Is this, none of us have the actual inside information about why biden won't um uh um forgive all student loans um or anything like that and it may be because there are financial institutions that would absolutely collapse and send the country into chaos at this time and maybe he doesn't want that on his watch either because i can think of no other reason to not forgive student loans other than some financial institution or multiple financial institutions could collapse, which could cause real problems to our economy. He's already dealing with inflation, which is getting better, and the supply side stuff, which has gotten much better. Much better. So yeah. the, he doesn't want to add a, yet another uh, log to the fire of economic issues going on in our country right now. Um, the student loan thing is, it's first of all, it's a tragedy that's been going on for decades now. Yes. You know, and I mean, the fact that I don't know if you're still paying off student loans, but the fact that, oh, yeah. that, you, that you know, people in their 50s who are yeah. thinking about retiring maybe in a decade or so are still paying off student loans mm -hmm. is really, really, really terrible. I mean, that's just, but yeah. and I'll, I'll give you two thoughts of why it hasn't been pushed for as hard mm -hmm. is the people that give lots of money to politicians aren't paying back their student loans. Yeah. It's the people, it's the Good middle point. class, Yeah, you know, people making a few hundred thousand dollars a year, they probably could pay off their student loans. Yeah. I also think that, and, and the, you know, uh, uh, institutions would collapse. Well, it just depends on how you spend your money. I mean, yeah. if we can bail out, this institution or that institution or spend hundreds of millions of dollars to the airlines or the cars or whatever, yeah. then you could stop these institutions from going out of money. That's, uh, that's not, I don't mm -hmm. see that as a problem. Right. But I also think though, is that if you look at how um, the cost of education, higher education has gone up compared to inflation, it's yeah. like six or seven times, right. you know? So the, the fact that it will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a college education is ridiculous mm -hmm. and it it is it is no longer a good deal to go to college you know and yeah. i think every, i think higher education is extremely important and people should go to college right. but we got to look at why the fuck does college cost so much damn money yeah you know yeah. And you've got people on, uh, you know, who are in the Trump side of things who are telling people uh, not to go to college. Charlie Kirk, who is a dropout or didn't even go to college, was sitting there at the recent convention. God, I wish you could remember if it was CPAC or something like this. And he was sitting there, or CPAC, and he was telling them, uh, people not to go to college, that those progressive teachers are going to put ideas in your head about equality. You should not go to college. There is nothing the Republican base or the Republicans party, Republican party has done more um, aggressively than underfunding education consistently for decades. And then you marvel at how a millions and millions of their base could fall for a huckster like Donald Trump and could believe election fraud conspiracy lies. This is the thing that I find fascinating is that you have to tie it to education. To me, there can be no other excuse. 
There is this is so important. If we have an educated populace, it's impossible to have a tyrant. It's just impossible. An educated populace, a worldly populace, a populace that has access and exposure to different points of views, different ways of life, does not side with a, ty a tyrant or a dictator. They just don't. That's why people get mad when people go to the big city because they get educated about the world in the big city. They don't stay in their small little hovels or in their small little towns believing whatever the town elders tell them to believe. And so this is where you find the difference. And another thing to throw out there, there are more people in those cities. There are more people in blue states than there are in red states. Yet well, yeah. red states are dictating our path in the country. That has to end as well. There's so much reform and change that needs to happen within our country. Um, and I think it is that smaller minority, whether it be Republican, whether they be, uh, you know, the supposed real American states or whatever, that fear what is happening, the progressive approach to the world that is happening all around them. And I think that's what you're seeing as the, as the basis for this kind of reaction and what we saw a year ago and what we're going to see again for sure. So a couple things. The, the the first thing is I absolutely think that universities are places where you should be exposed to different ideas. Mm -hmm. And while I'm not agreeing with the Republican stance, I also think that universities have become liberal bastions and that conservative voices are less heard today mm -hmm. than they were before. And that's that's not a good thing. So 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 like because I remember when I showed up at Berkeley, Berkeley, the land of liberals, yeah. there was there was definitely conservative movements there and there was oh, yeah. constant argument and discussion and that was awesome that was really mm -hmm. formative for me yeah. um that that's the first thing and i lost track of the second thing damn it okay. oh it's gone <laughs> there's another thing i was gonna say you were you what was the last thing you were talking about um just the idea of the uh, the uh, um the the small minority republican voters yes the okay now yeah. i remember it go, yes, okay go ahead. so i did the math because you know i like to figure out things mathematically sometimes <laughs> is that the the most populous state in the union is, is California with 40 million ish people. Yeah. And the least populated is Wyoming, which I think has 600,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And each, both California and Wyoming have two senators. Ah. And therefore, and I, this, I did this math a while ago, but it's something like a vote for Senate in Wyoming is 80 times more powerful than yours and my vote for a senator in California. Yeah because of the how many people we get to get two senators. And that is exactly why those states have more, way more power mm. in making decisions than the big states. Right, right. And I mean, I'm sorry, but that needs to change. Well, this if, is changing our constitution, which I agree with we have to do. Yeah, at some point. I mean, I, I get that you want to fill the court, uh, President Biden, but uh, the Supreme Court and all of that. But I think also take a look at this idea that if we are a supposedly democratic society, then that means the majority rules. And if the majority rules, the majority must A, be allowed to vote in free and fair elections freely, mm -hmm. uh, and B, which means everyone should be allowed to vote, everyone should be allowed to vote, and B, uh, people that have, or states that have more populace get more representation in Congress and in Senate. That just makes the most sense. So to me, it's crazy that it's not that way uh, for now. Um well, one of the other math things I did, and I can't remember what this math was, was I looked yeah. at the ratios between the most populous state and the least populous state today and compared them to the most populated colony and least populated colony in 1787 when the Constitution was formed. Yeah. And the ratio is way different. And that's where I kind of go like, look, if you went to James Madison and said, listen, this is going to be the proportionate difference between the populations of the states yeah. a couple hundred years from now, Madison probably wouldn't do the two senators from each state system because it becomes because that's, you know, the great compromise. That's Ben Franklin trying right. to make a deal. And now the deal doesn't work anymore. The, right. the, it's too disparate. I understand you want to give some extra power to states. What I would say is like you change the Constitution so that the re really the 15 biggest states get four senators. Mm. The next ones get three senators and then all the other states get two senators so yeah. that Yet, so small states like Wyoming, they still have an advantage. They still get extra power. They just don't get quite as much extra power. Yeah, yeah, true. Good point. Um, all right, let's see what we've got here. See, we've got more Streamlabs or Super Chats that have come through here. I'm going to refresh it here in just a second. Um, and uh, so, Steve, where are we? I mean, as we go into the tail end of the show here, um, I think two hours is long enough to talk about 
uh, this year. I can't believe it's almost at the two-hour mark. Pretty insane. If you're watching us right now, if you want to get in some Streamlabs and Super Chats, send them in now and let us know what you, what you think about everything that's happening here. What do you see happening now as we look forward into 2022 here? We're um, celebrating the one-year anniversary of the insurrection that happened that day, and a lot of people feel like this has only gotten worse, that more and more people have come aboard that train that have dug in their heels, that are ready to fight. Do you think there's a way out of this in 2022 um, at all? I really wish I could be more hopeful. I, mm. I really, really do. I think <clears throat> there were multiple moments from when Trump first ran for president where we thought, okay, that's it. Yeah, obviously he can't get back. You know, the insults to John McCain or Gold Star families or grabbing by the pussy or whatever the, right. you know, it's like, okay, that's it. That's it. And it was right. never it. And throughout his presidency, there were all sorts of things where it's like, okay, come on, we can't get past the first impeachment. Can't get past that. Oh, we can't right. get past this. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. And the fact that, and then the insurrection happens. And that was a moment. And we heard Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, you know, we heard Republicans condemn Trump. Yeah. And like, oh, finally. We've reached a thing that Trump can't get past. This is yeah. really going to be the thing that ends him. And the fact that it wasn't, and not only that, there's statistics, and I think it's, I, I wrote it down, but it's like they asked Republicans whether or not they condemned uh, the insurrection. And, and yeah. right after the insurrection, it was something like 48% completely condemned it. Yeah. And they asked Republicans that same question today, and it was 28%, <laughs> which means that, in fact, he's gotten stronger. Yeah. And this is, and the thing is, even without Trump, these yeah. conspiracy theories are growing and growing. And you mentioned, you know, that we need to have education in order to fight against this stuff, which I totally agree. Yeah. But there are a lot of educated people who are QAnon believers. Right. And right. so it's not just education is one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle, you know, to have a liberal democracy in terms of classical liberalism, you need to have clear accurate and dependable information mm -hmm. and that is what has been eroded because largely a like when fox news looks like the consistent accurate one compared to like oan and things like that mm -hmm. and then those things look responsible when compared to the shit that they're getting on social media yeah. and social media through its algorithms has all this power to just force feed you insanity we're in deep shit yeah that's that i wish i could say something hopeful but i'm not that hopeful right now mm. Yeah, and that's why I wanted you to come on the show, Steve. I always appreciate your mind, appreciate your point of view. And if you don't have, if you're not that hopeful, that makes me even more uh, worried about 2022 because you're one of the most hopeful people I know. Usually, usually, yeah, usually. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's why I wanted to have this discussion with you. And uh, thanks to everybody who joined us here tonight as well. The well over 100, uh, 1535. We had 135 of you watching at one point. Um, you know, I look forward to the future in 2022. And you know, as cynical as I can be, as as um, worried as I can be, I still have faith. I still have faith in us. I still have faith in the country that voted in Barack Obama for two terms. I still have faith that those people are out there somewhere and somehow Democrats have to work harder to reach them. Grandma uh, Pelosi and Grandpa Schumer ain't going to get the job done. Yeah. Other you know, great grandpa Joe Biden ain't going to get the job done somewhere, somehow. And, and in fighting amongst Democrats ain't going to get the job done. You know, no one's been more silent in this administration than Bernie Sanders, who had been more so vocal through the four years of the Trump administration. It doesn't mean that he hasn't said stuff. He has. Yeah. But there hasn't been that highlight on Bernie that we had through the four years of Trump. And so at some point, and this, and look, as a person, you know, who's of a certain age, I'm not advocating ageism. What I'm advocating is there needs to be a strong democratic push to find those young voices or younger voices that are going to rally this country and fight. Because I don't think there's any way out of this if we keep sitting and waiting for these people to come to their senses they're not going to because their policy, their approaches or their points of views or their stubborn idealism into this MAGA Trump QAnon stuff is leading them to power. So yeah. there is no, um, as you said, the carrot and the stick, there is no stick smacking them back or there's no rolled newspaper hitting them on the nose. Quite the opposite. They're getting a second tray of cat food to eat. And this is what I'm finding 
um, to be the issue here is uh, Democrats too often fight amongst themselves. I mean, the Bernie, Hillary, Debbie Wasserman, Schm uh, Schultz, uh, Donna Brazil situation is just a microcosm of what happens within the Democratic yeah. Party. And we're seeing with Cinema and Manchin just completely flipping, flipping Joe Biden off, telling him to kiss their ass. That's the, uh, another example of that. And at some point, we're going to have to accept as Democrats or liberals or progressives that a version of Trump on the Democratic pro liberal progressive side might not be a bad thing down the road. I know Ugh. some some people bristle <laughs> at that, but it might not be a bad thing down the road, especially if that person is putting forth progressive agendas and making it happen. And I'm not advocating for that. I'm saying there's a possibility that that might not be a bad thing down the road if it gets the job done. If what does it matter if we end up with more rights for people of color, more avenues of for people for LGBTQ community, more equality for women, more more the a better climate, a better future, all this kind of stuff? Steve, you and I are Star Trek fans. There's no way the Federation of Planets was built on Kumbaya principles. Some people had to take some tough stances, and we saw in the Lincoln movie that dramatization of him getting this bill passed to free the slaves, it was done through some pretty nefarious means. So we, at some point, we've got to put down the rose-colored lenses and get dirty, get in the dirt and get dirty, get in the muck and get dirty and fight. And I wonder when that moment is coming. Well, it's, it's this is always the balance to be struck because it, that a was lot. a lot. That took a lot out of me. Sorry. <laughs> it was a lot. But like, I guess the thing is, is that the <laughs> argument of if we get someone who is Trump-like and yeah. they help us get all these things, that's Mitch McConnell's argument. You know, which is which is if we have Trump and he helps us get judges on the bench, uh, right. low repealed environmental stuff changed, taxes lowered for corporations. Yeah. It was worth it. That's Mitch McConnell's argument, yeah. you know, and and so I there and but you're right. I mean, there is a place for practical politics and practical yeah. politics is not kumbaya. Right. It's but and it's always the balance. It's like if you know that we don't ever want to become what's happened to the Republican Party, you yeah. know. But we may have to. I don't know. We shall see. I, I know we don't want to, but you never know. Uh, Josh Mabry, uh, one of the last donations here says, I'll gladly donate to say this is not the conservatism I support. I'm middle right, which is crazy. Right. And that's why I love you, Josh. And that's why I appreciate you being part of the Outlaw Nation, brother, and always open to your points of views. So yeah, this is the thing at the end of the day. Democrats and liberals, I'm oh, sorry, Democrats and Republicans, it's about the issues. Let's yeah. go back to being about the issues. What's going on now with this Trump situation, it seems that adults have regressed back to high school and everything is world ending. Right. You know, the the Fox News, so they're all going on about the feelings. There is nobody who is louder about their feelings than the MAGA crowd, than the Trump crowd, than the uh, Republican uh, House uh, members and Republican Senate members constantly crying about their feelings and whining about their feelings about what the liberals are doing, what the supposedly um, uh, crazy left is doing, the militant left. They cry about their feelings all night on Fox News, on Newsmax, on OAN, and, and, and sit there and have the audacity to say that the Democrats are the ones who are caught up in their feelings. Lord Almighty, watch a Tucker Carlson uh, one hour, and it's about 500 different emotions at once, which with weird faces following each and every one of his high-pitched screams or bellows, uh, that's all about his feelings. So it's just fascinating. Or Hannity's, you know, um, supposed uh, offense or Don Bognino losing his mind on Geraldo. You're seeing feelings all over the place on the extreme right uh, wing, quote unquote, news outlets uh, that are there. So I find it fascinating that they're so willing to make fun of Democrats when they are so unaware of their own whining and crying and, and complaining about their feelings. Well, it's what I said you know, a couple hours ago when we started is that that's where Republicans have used emotions to get them where they are. Yeah. You know, like when they talk about Obamacare and all the attacks on Obamacare and the people would say when, when they found out that that was the Affordable Care Act, they're like, don't take that away from me. Yeah. The, the attack was emotional, not logical. Right, right. You know, it's like you put a label on a thing and people can't respond emotionally. Yeah. And then you explain what the thing is. Well, aren't you happy you got this child tax credit? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. You're not going to take that away. <laughs> yes, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> like you're not making enough money to qualify. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, Tushka sent in the stream live here says, while on the topic of state representation in the federal government, what are your thoughts on tribal representation? Tribes have sovereignty and are considered nations within a nation. They are also subject to many federal laws and regulations. Um, I don't have uh, a, an incredibly deep knowledge of the tribal politics and the tribal situation. To me, the original Americans are the Native Americans. So uh, whatever gives them access to a seat at the table and a, and a permanent seat at the table, I am for. So that's what I would say to that. Oh, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to say pretty much exactly what you said. I am mm -hmm. far from an expert, but the fact that there are these sovereign nations living within our country that are subject to federal laws and don't have representation the way that they should is wrong. Yeah. And, and particularly when you put it on the historical, disturbing, repeated sins that we've committed against yeah. the native population yeah. to go to not bring welcome them in to the seat of government seems real wrong yeah yeah a thousand percent agreed a thousand percent agreed so yeah uh, uh tushka um on one of our hangouts anytime you want to educate me on this uh, absolutely i'm down i'm sure the lady outlaw as half native american has some thoughts on uh, having uh, grown up with uh, her family part of her family on the res on a reservation uh, um uh, yeah i'm sure there's a lot to explore here uh, but agree with Steve. Representation absolutely has to be there at the table for all Native Americans. Enough is enough already, for God's sake. So, you know, I don't know. It's crazy what's going on out there. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. I wanted to commemorate this a year later to talk about it. And I knew getting Steve on the show would be fantastic and lead to a discussion that disappeared within two hours. And I'll be damned. Two hours are gone without me even knowing it. It's incredible uh, how much we were able to cover and talk about. And we only scratched the surface of all the stuff because so much has happened on that uh, January 6th committee over the last six months. And hopefully more and more people are going to get subpoenaed and be forced to show up enough with the whole criminal uh, sending, sending a criminal censure. Fuck that. Send the police to their houses, drag them out by handcuffs, put them down in front of your committee and have them answer questions under oath. And if they lie, put them in jail for perjury. That's how we get to the truth for yep. God's sakes. And that applies to everybody. I don't give a fuck if you're Trump or a business owner who crashed into the Capitol and, and, and did and defecated in the Capitol like a bunch of animals and wrote things all over the Capitol. That's, I want that to apply to everybody. Garland, Merrick Garland, Attorney General Merrick Garland, you said, no matter what level, I, ho I hold you to it. These are two powerful speeches back to back, Steve, from President Joe Biden and Merrick yeah. Garland. Now let's see what they do over these next 12 months and if they adhere to it. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much to Steve Morris for joining us. Steve, where can people find you, brother man? Always great to talk with you. Tell us, everybody, where they can find you and everything you got going on, my man. Well, you know I love having these conversations, too. We were just talking about it a few days ago. Yeah. I got a lot in me sometimes that I need <laughs> to get out, and I really appreciate you having me on the show and giving Absolutely. me a, the opportunity to open up my mouth for a while. Uh, you can find me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. Uh, the Cinephiles, which are obviously John and I host together, we're going to be back on camera on yes. Sunday at this 2 p.m. to have a much more hopeful and happy conversation about yeah. movies, the year of 2021, what happened in entertainment, and looking forward both to the world of the Cinephiles in 2022 and the general world of film and entertainment. It should be a lot of fun. So come to the Cinephiles YouTube channel at 2 o'clock. You could also, if you're a Star Trek fan, I have a Star Trek show uh, with Scott Mance enterprise incidents with scott and steve check that out and of course i love interacting with all of you on social media so check me out on sr morris there you go and sr morris one on instagram on instagram yeah that's right uh jason earhart jumped in right here at the end and, and sent in a nice donation said i just wanted to jump in and say hi to two of my favorite people we live in a really crazy time and i'm glad that i have the cinephiles and the outlaw nation to get me through it thanks for all that you two do thank you thank you jason you're awesome, brother, man. And again, thanks to everybody who hung out with us tonight. Please remember to hit a like on this video. Share it on your social media. Leave a comment down below. Likes and comments elevate the visibility of the channel and this show in particular. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe down below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button so you see when we're dropping all the new content. I just did a uh, trailer reaction for Moonfall. I've got uh, reviews for Macbeth and the Tender Bar coming tomorrow. Also, the John and Wendy show back next week. Uh, so much happening. And as Steve said, the cinephiles at 2 p.m. PT 
uh, on Sunday and tomorrow night live at 5 p.m. The Geek Buddies welcome Laura Kelly wow. back to do our spoiler review of episode two of the book of Boba Fett, The Tribes of Tatooine. So join us at 5 p.m. PT live tomorrow night for that spoiler review on this channel for sure. All right, y'all take care of yourselves. I love you madly. We'll talk to you next time. And yes, Outlaw Nation for life. And one last thing as I, I'm going to end the show like I end every show, whatever you need to do to get through the next second, next minute, next hour, next day, next week, next month, next year. I want you to do it. I know it looks crazy out there. I know it's tough out there. In some days, it's hard to put one foot in front of the other. Fuck, one toe in front of the other. But I want you to do that because you never know what's waiting for you on the other side. And you may be the most important person in our world, depending on where you end up. And you never know what role you have to play. So please find a way to get through the tough times because we are here for you and we love you. All right. Take care of yourselves. Be well. And I'll talk to you next week with another brand new live episode of Outlaw Nation. Peace and love. Thank you.